So we've been talking about how to create good experiments, and one of the aspects that is usually not addressed very well about that is the idea of sampling. And this video is an optional video. It's not going to be tested in, in any one of my classes, but uh, I like to give people a full um, spectrum when I'm teaching. And so if you uh, want, you can watch this and know a little bit more about how to create good experiments. Now, when it comes to sampling, this has to do with getting a population that's too large for you to measure everybody, and to create groups, experimental control groups, placebo groups, that truly represent this population so that you can uh, do a proper test of this population, right? Uh, uh, otherwise, your experiment won't be valid because you won't have tested in a way that truly represents what's going to happen in the real world. So how do you get from an entire population to create groups? The most important thing to do uh, is there's, there's two types of sampling techniques. You have what's called random probability sampling or no non-probability sampling. Probability sampling attempts to remove bias to make sure that when you set up your groups they're equivalent to each other and that all people in the population have an equal chance of being selected to any one of the groups that you have in the experiment. But that, what that means is that you know if I have a control group, an experimental group, any one member of the population has an equal chance of ending up in any one of the groups that I'm talking about. So that's probability sampling, and there's a lot of ways of, of doing that. Um, so and we're going to be talking about that. But when it comes to probability, you know, you can say, for example, let's say you have two conditions. You can flip a coin. If you get heads, the person goes to condition one. If you get tails, they go to condition two. Uh, you can also put peop uh, people's name in a hat, and you uh, and every time uh, a couple, uh, you could get off the hat to see if the person, which group the person goes to, or you can use a random numbers table and. For example, let's say that you have nine groups, and so you follow along like this. Um, you say, I'm going to start on line two, uh, number five. So one, line two, number five. So the first group will go to number group five. The second group will go to group seven. Then the group eight. Then group seven again. The group three. So what you're doing here is you're making sure that uh, you use a computer a program to generate random numbers, and then you follow these random numbers to sort the people in the different groups that you have. It's very good software. Uh, and that's different ways to create randomness, right? But even on the process of creating this uh, group, uh, there's other variations of creating this. Now, this is what we call a simple random sample. When you get uh, the entire population and you use one of these randomizing techniques and you select a, a group of the population randomly and then you put them in the conditions randomly as well. But there's also other ways of doing this. Uh, one way is called systematic sampling, and that's when you get the population and you line people up randomly in numbers, and you, or in other words, you randomly give people numbers, and then you say, um, I'm going to pick every third person in the population. So there you go. Then that you, that you create a systematic sample. The only uh, danger here of the systematic sample is that you got to make sure that when people line up, you line them up randomly. Otherwise, you're going to have some, a problem uh, when, you, when you select from that group. But the systematic sample is cool because it's a very simple method to deliver the randomization of the population. So a lot of people use that. Another one I mentioned before, actually, is the idea of stratified sampling. So let's say, for example, that I want to make sure that my final groups uh, represent different groups that should exist in the population. I want to make sure that Caucasians are represented, that African Americans are represented, that Hispanic Americans are represented. So before it, I sort the people into the groups. I will separate the population in what we call strata or groups. So I will create these groups myself. They don't really exist in the population. These are categorizations that I make up, you know. Uh, and so I create a group, a criteria for Caucasians. And then I line all the Caucasians up. And then I line all the African Americans up. I line all the Hispanic Americans up. And then I randomly sort from each of these groups into the samples to make sure that people from each of the groups end up on the samples. So you see how uh, that's what we did here. We got the population. We sort them into the groups that I wanted to create. And then we made sure that people from each group were in the population. That's a really cool way of doing this. Now, there's also, now there is a different version. It's called proportionate sampling. It's kind of like stratified sampling, except this time that you make sure that what ends up in the final population matches the proportion that uh, w what ends up in your sample matches the proportion that were in the population. Like look here for example, there's only a few or there's only one line of these browns and of these greens over here. 
while everybody else has two lines. So when I create my sample, my uh, strata sample, I make sure that the groups, the ratio that ends up in the group is the same ratio that ends up in the population. You know, and that's good if you want to make sure that your group is, is represented by the population. But remember that any one of the grays over here had an equal chance of being picked as the gray that ends up in this particular group. And that's why it is still probability sampling. It's still random. Another interesting kind that's similar to this too, it's called cluster sampling. And in this case, it's, it's groups that already exist in the population. And so that means, you, you for example, your, the population is already divided in areas which we call clusters. And then what you end up doing is that from each uh, cluster, you randomly select a certain group of people. Uh, let's say, for example, um, neighborhoods, right? Population is already set up in neighborhoods. So you make sure that you randomly select a certain number from each neighborhood to, set, to represent your, the population of your state, for example. So you, what you did that is called cluster sampling. You didn't look at the whole state as a whole. You looked at the groups that already existed in the state, and then you set, set it up. The only problem with that is that if there's anything peculiar about one group more than the other, you're going to end up creating samples which are not exactly the same. Maybe one group has more greens than the other and so forth, you know, and that could create problems. But sometimes it's the easiest way you have because you already have these groups already there in the population. Another interesting kind of sampling is what we call a multi-stage sampling. Now, let's say, for example, you wanted to sample the population of the world. Obviously, it's going to be very, very hard for you to do this. So what you're going to end up doing here is you're going to do uh, in cl clusters which are smaller and smaller. So let's say, for example, I'll first I'll randomly sample some of the countries of the world. So there's like 200-some countries, and I'll select a random sample of those countries. Now, of those countries, I will in each country, I'll randomly select some of the states from each of the countries. Now within the states, I will randomly select some of the counties on each state. Now within each, each county that was selected, I will select a few of the neighborhoods, a few of the cities. And that way, I ended up selecting only a few people to represent the world, but every step of the way, I randomly picked one cluster from the groups that were available. And that's called multi-state sampling. So these are the kinds of probability sampling that try to make sure that you maintain uh, some sort of representation and equal chances of any one person uh, ending up in the groups that you're looking at. But uh, you got to make sure, though, that these groups are equal. So a lot of people do what it's called pre-testing, where you, well, after you set up your groups, your experimental group, your control group, you test them for whatever uh, dependent variable you're looking at to make sure they're air equivalent on the, the dependent variable. So let's say, for example, I'm doing a study on, on stati satisfaction with the government in the state, and I did a cluster sampling, and I look at the neighborhoods, whatever, and then I set up three groups to make sure that the initial uh, number was the same. I test all three groups for the satisfaction with the government before I introduce them to the treatment. That could be, for example, an informational video about the government and the things that they've been doing. And then I'll test them again to compare and see if their impressions of the government changed after the video. But you see, that pretest was important because I had to make sure that the groups were equivalent uh, even after I did all the random sampling process that I did before. But sometimes research uh, is done without worrying about doing these kinds of random samplings because you're just doing some sort of exploratory study or you're just trying to see, you know, this is my observation. I'm just in, this is my initial step. Now, the, what I'm about to discuss are other ways of sampling which are not very good. You're not, you don't want to do this uh, very often. You only want to do this when you have a specific reason for it. Uh, one example is what is called haphazard sampling. And that's when you uh, basically sample the first available people that show up. Well, obviously, that's going to introduce bias. It, it might be because that time of day, a certain group of people were there. Uh, you don't. You can't just sample the, the without worrying about who you're sampling, unless your whole point is to just do some sort of exploration. I would just want to see what's out there, you know, and you're not really using that to make any sort of causation or any 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 kind of a true statement about what the population really is saying. Otherwise, you're going to end up making a mistake when you do that. Uh, likewise, there's also what is called a, a purposive sampling. And that's when you select a specific group for the population because you want to look at that specific group. 
I don't care what everybody else has to say about this. I only want to know what the children want to say about this. And so you purposely select a group. But you see, there could be applications for that. But then you can't say that you were talking about the whole population when you purposely selected only a group of the population. So you got to be careful about the generalizations that you make after you use this kind of sampling. Another interesting sample is called the convenience sample. And that's kind of like the haphazard sampling, but it's a specific type. It's when you like, basically, you select what, whoever was available at the time, whoever was the easiest. So you're in the street, you're walking around, and you select whoever walks up to you, you know, uh, or whoever is close to you, or whoever you say happen to walk into. Um, so obviously it's going to introduce bias because there could be something peculiar about the people who are out at that time of day or who agree to talk to you and things like that. You know, a lot of times people don't. So, but it's a way that people do surveys just when they do, when they do explorations of the topic. An interesting type, it's called, now there are a few more types that I actually don't have here. Uh, so one of them is called snowball sampling, and that's when the research uh, searcher asks people to, uh, that are in the study to find other people for him. So, like, for example, I'm doing a study that's something of really rare, that's really hard to find people in the population that are like that, you know? Uh, and then I ask the people, okay, do you happen to know anybody else that's like you so that, you know, you can bring them into the study as well? So this is like snowball sampling. You find someone and then you use that person to find other people. And But then that means that, you know, is, you're going to introduce bias because it might just be the people that that person know and there might be something peculiar about those people. There's also sequential sampling, you know, and that's when you basically do a convenient sample. And then after you're done with those people, you get another convenient sample. And then after you're done with those people, you get another convenient sample. But there's no way to, to figure out if this, these samples are representing the population. You're just kind of uh, getting more and more information without uh, worrying about uh, whether or not it's, it's representative or not. But you're only doing that when you're trying to do an exploration. You're, it's your first, you know, I just want to see what's out there kind of thing. All right? So this is sampling. And I hope you understand a little bit more about the different kinds of sampling. And what matters is that when you're creating groups, you worry about what kind of group you created, uh, were you fair when you pull, pulled people out of the population? Um, were, you, were you correct when you created the groups and you differentiated between them? Uh, was it an equal chance of them being an experimental versus control group? What is the purpose of your study? What kind of generalizations can you do if you did a certain kind of sample? That's the concerns that you have to think about. If you did a probability sampling, you probably gave equal chances for people in the population to end up being selected. You gave equal chances of people in the population to end up in any one of the groups. And in the non-probability sample, though, you probably use that when you're trying to explore the topics and you're just trying to see a general idea. But then you have to be careful to the generalizations that you do off those groups because you have to make sure you understand that they probably don't represent the population at large. But whatever way you look at it, there's a lot of techniques of sampling out there. And this is just an introduction video to just give you a little uh, idea about what they are. And I hope you understand what they are now.